Okay, recording. Uh, so uh, yeah, so next thing we're going to talk about is uh, uh, some tools for uh, for uh, helping to draw pictures uh, of uh, uh, solution sets to equations. So you know, given an equation and three variables, how do I draw a picture of this thing? Right, and y'all have already encountered some issues with this on the homework exercises. Um, so uh, there are a few uh, tips and tricks that I think are handy. Uh, I want to show you now. So uh, first one, we're going to talk about rotations, which uh, really handy observation to make sometimes. So here we go. Um, it starts with an algebraic observation. If, and this is a big if, this does not apply to most equations. But if the equation involves x's and y's only in this form, Right, if this is the only way that x and y show up in the equation. Now, pause before I finish that sentence. How easy is that to observe, right? You just look for where the, where's the x's and y's in the equation. And if you see any that are not in this form, then okay, all right, too bad. I guess we can't apply this. But if all the x's and y appear only as part of this expression, then we get this powerful conclusion. Um, we're looking at a surface that is rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. That's a huge amount of geometric information from a casual al uh, a casual observation of the algebra. Okay, so let me try to persuade you that this is true, then I'll show you how to make use of it. Um, so uh, imagine we have such an equation, and let's think about the following two points. We have uh, this point right here, and then imagine that I were to rotate that point around the z-axis uh, to get me then a different point. And let's think about these two points. Well, they have different x's and different y's. Okay, but they do have the same z-coordinate. And furthermore, even though they have different x's and y's, this expression here, square root of x squared plus y squared, being as it is distance from the z-axis, that's the same for these two points also. So in terms of everything that appears in the actual equation, these two points are indistinguishable as far as the equation is concerned. And therefore, uh, either they both work or neither works. And if you think about it, the conclusion from this is that our surface has to be rotationally symmetric because any point that's on the surface, you can rotate it around all you want, all those resulting points also on the surface. Okay. All right, now here's a different point of view. Um, if X and Y show up only in this form, then let's think about how we would write down the cylindrical equation for this. Uh, how, what's going to happen when I plug in x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta and uh, all of that stuff. And the thing is, if all of the x's and y's appear only in this form, all of these expressions just turn into r. And so in the conversion, the, there's no thetas. There's been no, there is no way that thetas could actually show up in the equation. So if, if you think about it, if you have a cylindrical equation with no thetas in it, we talked about this last time, if there's no thetas, then theta doesn't matter, which means all the theta cross sections look exactly the same, which means it's rotationally symmetric. So we have kind of two different points of view, if you will, on uh, why this conclusion is true. Uh, now let me show you how useful it is. Uh, the big idea is that if you have a rotational symmetry, then you can view it literally as being a rotation of any one of its cross sections. Any one of its appropriate cross section, namely a cross section and what you might call a theta plane. Uh, it, any cross section containing the axis of symmetry. Yeah? Um, does this also apply if the spherical Oh, let me think about that. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I, I haven't. I haven't actually thought that through. But my first instinct is, yeah, if, they, if theta doesn't matter, let's just think it through. If, if there is no thetas, then theta doesn't matter. You're going to get the same cross section in every theta plane. Yeah, totally. Nice observation. Okay, so let's, uh, how does the rubber meet the road here? Let's look at this equation right here. Previously, we saw this equation. Uh, when we were talking about graphs, I made the observation this is the graph 
of uh, this function right here. And we did make some observations about its horizontal cross sections being level sets and all that stuff. We're not going to go back to that. But um, I uh, asserted without justification last time uh, that this equation gives us a bowl. Right? So now let me show you how to make a good argument about this. Well, step one x and y appear only in the indicated form. Now, wait a second, where's the square root? Okay, well, just keep in mind that this equation is equivalent to z equals square root of x squared plus y squared squared. So, again, as required, x and y appear only as part of the special form. Right? I mean, it arguably written a little differently, but, you know, this is the same. Um, and as such, we're rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. So we know that our result has to have this kind of like, uh, you know, it doesn't, ma you know, it's all the, it, it's got this rotational symmetry that, you know, like as, as I have indicated here. Well, again, if it's got that rotational symmetry, all I really have to do is understand any one of the cross sections. So with the axis being the z-axis, I can now pick any plane containing the z-axis, and you've got options, right? I mean, there's several different planes that I can draw that contain the z-axis, right? Pick your favorite. It doesn't matter. Now, just because I have the thing already drawn, I'm going to go ahead and go with this one. Uh, notice that this is the one where x is equal to 0. So there's my equation for this plane. And now let's ask the question, what does this curve look like that is that cross-section? Where did I get this parabola from? Well, I'm looking at a surface with this equation, and I'm taking the cross-section by way of that equation. And so I am literally going to plug in this into there, and out comes this. Z equals y squared, and flashbacks to algebra one, uh, this is clearly a parabola, as I have drawn there. Is everybody on board? All right, so here we go. Uh, we've got a rotationally symmetric surface. I know that it's going to therefore be the result of rotating this cross-section. Now, geometric appeal. Uh, what happens geometrically when you rotate this cross-section that I have in purple? Now rotate that around the z-axis, and it generates a bowl. Pretty persuasive, I think. Everybody get it? Everybody's happy? Really powerful trick. Let me show you another example. Um, <clears throat> let's study this equation right here. And again, notice the special form. X and Y appear only in the special form. Therefore, we have a rotational symmetry around the z-axis. Therefore, again, I can pick any plane that I want as long as it contains the z-axis. Uh, take your pick. Uh, now, just to mix it up uh, here, let's take this different plane containing the z-axis. This one is uh, y equals zero. What's that? What is the curve that is this cross-section? Well, this mysterious curve is what you get when you combine these two equations and you plug in y equals zero, it turns into this, which y'all will recognize as a hyperbola. And y'all may have uh, you know, uh, reflexive uh, ick, right? Thinking back to the, the question of in Algebra 2, wait a minute, which way does the hyperbola go? Does it open up along the which axis and how do you remember? It's very confusing. Um, so uh, let me just take this opportunity to remind you, you know, prerequisite to the course and all that. So make sure to straighten that out in your minds. Uh, if you if you don't feel like you ever had a good system for how to reliably get it straight, you know, as to whether this should be, you know, this parabola as I have it drawn here, or if it should be something more like this. And if you're not sure how to tell the difference, come to office hours. I'll be happy to um, uh, talk through how to how to think that think about that. Anyway, uh, this hyperbola here is like that. We know it's rotationally symmetric. 
So we rotate this cross section and geometric appeal, when you rotate that curve, uh, what you get is, uh, let's see here, my, so my original surface then, you get something that looks kind of like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is called a hyperboloid, because it's a rotation of a hyperbola, hyperboloid of one sheet. And we'll see in a minute why we call it, why we have to actually say of one sheet. How are we doing? Everybody's good. Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to make a, another appeal uh, to uh, there is a similar argument. I'm going to leave it as an exercise. I think it's a very healthy exercise to think this through on your own. Why does this similar argument actually work? Uh, what I want you to do is to think in terms of kind of reproducing what we talked about here. Right? And think in terms of how would you, how would you have to adjust this argument um, if we were rotating around a different axis. Right? So anyway, I'm just going to go with the, uh, the conclusion. Uh, and uh, here we go. So with that in mind, we're going to study this equation right here. And uh, first, a, a bit of bad news. Look at the x and the y. Do x and y appear only as part of the special form? No. It just doesn't. And there's a minus sign. That's just a minus sign. But, oh, yeah, but you can't get rid of it. And it, ah, it's really importantly different. And so, no, just absolutely not. This is a fail. You cannot make an argument on this question about rotational symmetry around the z-axis. It does not have rotational symmetry around the z-axis. It's just absolute face plant. No. Does everybody get to see how this failed? And it's all, again, it seems tragic because it's just the fault of that one minus sign. It's super annoying. But, oh well. The good news. Y and Z appear only in the special form. Now, when you look at it like that, it, again, it doesn't quite exactly jump out at you. But if you rewrite the equation a little bit, nothing really happened there. But now you can see Y and Z appear only in the special form. So the claim that I'm going to make from the similar argument that y'all are going to think through on your own in a, by analogy to what we did on the last page is that this has a rotational symmetry around the x-axis. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, so what? Well, if it's got that rotational symmetry around the x-axis, I can pick any plane containing that axis. So again, that gives me options. I can think about either of these planes, or if I wanted to get creative, which I do not recommend in this case, by the way, but if I wanted to, I, in, in any of these planes that contains the axis of symmetry, knock yourself out. Uh, I'm going to pick this one because I already have it drawn already. And also, it's the one plane that I haven't picked yet. So just to show that this works too. Um, notice this is the plane z equals zero. Right, so how would I understand this cross section uh, in that plane? Well, I look at the plane that I'm taking a cross section by. I look at the original equation that I'm taking the cross section of. And that turns into this x squared minus y squared equals 1. Again, hyperbola. Again, algebra 2. It's this, um, it's this hyperbola that I have drawn in purple right there. Yep? So essentially, we can manipulate the equation however we really like, and as long as we can get the special form that works. As long as y and z, in this case, appear only in that special form. So it's not enough to make the special form appear. It has to be that those variables that you're arguing about appear only in that form. Right, so if there were an extra y over here, if this were you know equals y instead of uh, instead of equals one, then no, crash and burn, absolutely not, no symmetry, because uh, y it, it does not appear only in the special form. Does that make sense? So if in the original equation the uh, before the z squared is the plus sign, then will it work as well? Do what now? Like if the original equation is x squared minus y squared plus z squared. Oh, if, okay, so uh, if this were a plus right here, yeah. then y and z do not appear in the special form. 
uh, and uh, X and Y do not appear in the special form, but in this case, X and Z would appear only in the special form, and then you could talk about symmetry around the Y axis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this is a delicate argument, right? When you make a rotational symmetry argument, it is extremely inflexible, right? And uh, close does not count, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyway. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so we've got a uh, hyperbola. We know that's the cross-section. We think about what happens when we rotate that around. And, again, just a geometric appeal, but when you rotate this purple hyperbola around the x-axis, uh, I claim that you're going to get a surface. Oh, gosh, let's see here. You're going to get a surface. Uh, that is, uh, well, it's this here. It, it's a hard thing to draw. It's two, I like to call this uh, two contact lenses that are kind of staring at each other. To me, this is called the staring contest surface. Uh, but uh, more commonly, hyperboloid of two sheets. Yes? Um, so if all of the minus signs were plus signs, yep. could you? Yeah, then you'd have three different options. Yeah, totally. You'd also have a sphere. And it'd be, you know, observably a sphere. But yes, um, if uh, if there were all plus signs, then you can argue, um, you know, rotational symmetry around any of the three axes. Yeah. Okay, so um, so yeah, always be on the lookout for, you know, when you see an equation, um, look for the possibility that uh, the variables that any of the three possible pairs of variables might appear only in the special form. And then you have this tremendous foot in the door uh, that uh, allows you to answer your question. Okay, so now next trick, um, what I like to call deformations. So uh, I'm just going to basically introduce you to this idea with an example and uh, then make the, uh, the usual appeal of uh, notice that there's a pattern and I claim the pattern appears in lots of, and, you know, applies in lots of different forms. So let's just dive into this example. Um, so suppose you have a surface um, and, and uh, if uh, that surface has an equation and then now let's ask the question, what happens if you do the following? So if you were to take all the z's in the equation and replace every single z with 2z. So algebraically, if I make that little modification, question, what does that do geometrically to the surface, right? If you tweak the equation, presumably that will, in some sense, tweak the surface. So geometrically, what is the, uh, how would you describe geometrically how this, how this uh, uh, geometric tweak uh, works. Okay, so uh, here's my point of view on this, and again, I'm not going to prove this. I, this is just a kind of a think it through kind of a deal. But uh, let's think about this point right there. This point three comma four comma twelve, and you can do the arithmetic and uh, uh, persuade yourself that does satisfy this original equation. So we've got a point on our green surface. If I were to take this point and plug it into that surface, it will fail. Well, of course it does. I changed the equation. Of course it's not going to work, right? But, but what we can do is we can see why it failed. The reason it failed in some sense is that uh, I had been putting 12 in there as the thing that was going to get squared. And now because the equation has changed, that 12, when I put it in there, the first thing that happens is it gets multiplied by 2. It's not 12 anymore. Now it's 24 getting squared. Obviously, of course, it's not going to work anymore. And the arithmetic's all different. Okay. But we can uh, get clever and cute. Right? And realize, look, what I really need, what I really need here is for the thing that's about to get squared, the thing that used to be z, but the thing that is now 2z, I need that to be 12. And I can make that happen by choosing a point where z is 6 instead of 12. 
And then when I plug in that 6, it gets multiplied by 2 and becomes 12, which when I square it, it leads me to the exact same arithmetic morally uh, that uh, I had in the previous exam. So it's just kind of, you know, smart alecky observation. And uh, let me say that differently then. Uh, when uh, that purple point works in the original equation, now this point, 3, 4, 6, works in the new equation. So I'm going to make the following sort of conclusion from this. When you do this algebraic replacement, you replace z with 2z, then, oh, I missed, uh, then the, uh, the z coordinate of that purple point just gets cut in half. So geometrically what happens then, every point, its z coordinate gets divided by two. Effectively, the whole surface just gets squished by a factor of two uh, in the z direction. Everybody kind of see how that arithmetic works out? And, uh, um, and I claim that this is, a, this is a general pattern. Whatever you do to the equation, the points that are going to be solutions have to kind of counteract to, to undo what you did algebraically. And so here's how I'm going to write that uh, as, a, um, as a general rule. Um, uh, whatever you do to a variable in an equation, the opposite happens to the surface. Okay. All right, so here's uh, an example. Uh, <clears throat> if I were to start with this equation, which of course is a sphere, um, as we can see from a variety of different points of view, spherical equation is rho equals one. Rotational symmetry around any of the three axes, take your pick, plenty of arguments. All right, what would happen if I were to, everywhere I see an X, put X over A, and then likewise, everywhere I see a Y, put Y over B, everywhere I see a Z, put Z over C. What would happen is the equation would turn into this. Uh, now that's, that's the algebraic process. That green equation turns into this orange equation. Now let's think about what happens geometrically. In the algebra, I divided by A, B, and C, uh, re respectively, on the three input variables. So algebraically, uh, excuse me, geometrically then, there's going to be stretching, right? And, in, and so I'm going to end up with an ellipsoid. Oh, uh, wrong color again, sorry. Uh, I'm going to end up with this ellipsoid here where instead of having a, uh, you know, what you might call a radius in the x direction, of one, now we have a radius in the x direction that's bigger, presumably. Now my radius in the x direction is a. It's been stretched in the x direction. Everybody happy? Okay. All right. Now, in practice, how are y'all going to use this? Where? How, how uh, is? Uh, let's see. What kinds of questions are you going to encounter that are going to make you pull this tool out of the toolbox and apply it? Uh, it's going to come in the following form, usually. And that is, you're going to find yourself needing to understand the solutions to this equation. And you're going to be like, but I don't know the solutions to this equation. And there's no rotational symmetry argument that I can make because the A, B, and C being different, uh, just uh, the proper form just doesn't come up. And uh, I don't, we don't know what to do. So how am I going to understand this equation? And what you're going to do is think, ah, but I do understand this equation. That's a sphere. Rotational symmetry arguments. I like this equation because I've got tools and I know what the answer is. It's that known surface. And then you're going to think to yourself, okay, since I already understand all of this, I just have to then adjust appropriately Think about what modifications you have to do to your, you know, your sort of um, uh, prior, you know, your starting point surface in green over there. Think through those modifications that make the algebra happen, and then draw the appropriate geometric conclusion. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So several more examples that I'm going to leave the details for y'all. 
to do. Uh, but uh, how would I understand uh, this equation? Oh my gosh, well, it doesn't have any rotational symmetries. This is hard. What are we going to do about that? Ah, that looks an awful lot like this, which I already understand. I know exactly what needs to happen to the algebra to turn what I understand into what I wish I understood. And then just do the appropriate geometrically sort of corresponding uh, uh, process to your known starting point. We know that that green surface is a paraboloid. Previously argued. Rotational symmetry argument and all that. And uh, so this must be uh, uh, you know, what you get when you take a paraboloid and stretch it in the x direction by a factor of a and then you stretch it in the y direction by a factor of b. And that's called an elliptical paraboloid. So same thing down here. How would you understand this? Well, that's clearly a stretched out version of this, which we've already studied. And so, again, we can draw the geometric conclusion. And this is an elliptical hyperboloid of two sheets. Okay. Okay, some other good examples in the book. Take a look at those. Moving along. By the way, we're going to be uh, moving really fast today. Uh, again, tough choices and all of that. Um, uh, roughly speaking, uh, as tempting as it is to want to sort of uh, dwell on every little detail of what we're doing now, um, we're going to need the time more when we get to chapters 6 and 7 in particular. Mm, excuse me. Also somewhat 5. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, this material here is the relatively uh, relatively easy part. And uh, the chapters 5, 6, and 7 are going to get really interesting. Okay, so let's talk about derivatives now. We're going to do our very first calculus of this course in multivariable calculus. We haven't done any calculus hardly to speak of, I guess, to this point. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about derivatives. What's a derivative? Big question. Turns out there's multiple different kinds of derivatives. This is something you're going to have to get used to in multivariable calculus. It's not just that there is a derivative. Well, they're kind of. Anyway, there's multiple different kinds of derivatives. There's one that's the best one, and we're going to get to that later. And it's going to be referred to as the derivative, but it's really not the only one. And so we shouldn't call it the derivative, but we kind of do in practice. Anyway, so be prepared. We're going to see a bunch of different kinds of derivatives. Um, the thing that makes them relate to each other, different as they are, is that they all have this common unifying feature. They all, in their various different ways, relate input changes to output changes. Now that hopefully rings some bells from single variable calculus, Calc 1. Um, you can think of the derivative as so, yeah, I'm just, it's the, mm, the ratio between input change and output change, if you like. It's the thing that you multiply by input change to approximate output change. Say it however you like it, but it is a relationship. Uh, you know, think flexibly. Um, but it's a relationship between input changes and output changes. So all of the different kinds of derivatives we're going to see will all have this unifying feature in some sense or another. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, I'm going to start with partial derivatives uh, for uh, several good reasons. I want to notice, though, conspicuously absent from this list of good reasons to start with partial derivatives is... Um, any suggestion that this is fundamental or, um, you know, uh, really the best way to think about derivatives, it's really not. So uh, I uh, uh, don't uh, really, I'm not super happy about starting with partial derivatives. Side note, in my own book, I do not start with partial derivatives. Most multivariable calculus books do. I don't. But anyway, that we're not using my book. So, um We'll come back and talk later about what uh, the shortcomings of partial derivatives are. For the moment, let's just proceed. Here's the deal. This is uh, how you compute a partial derivative. Just take your multivariable function, and by the way, let me write up here. We are talking here about a function that has multiple input variables. 
So the domain is Rn. And just to get the ball rolling, let's pretend that it's real valued. It doesn't really matter that it's real valued. It could be vector valued. But, but let's, anyway, just to keep it simple, let's uh, start off thinking of it being real valued. Uh, the way that you compute partial derivatives. All the variables except for one, keep in mind there's n different input variables. All of them except for one, you're going to view as being constant. You're going to pretend, for the purposes of that calculation, you're going to pretend that they're constants. And if you, let's think about that now. So uh, we, we have we have n variables. Most of them we're going to snap our fingers and solidify. Now they're not allowed to change anymore. They're not really variables anymore, are they? Right? They're constants now. So I now no longer have n variables. Now I have one variable and n minus one constants. Punchline: one variable. Right? So whichever one you leave as a variable is the single variable of your now single variable function. And if you've got a single variable function, then you can just straight up take the derivative of that single variable function because we know how to do single variable derivatives. Does that make sense? Process. Now, much left to be discussed. Um, how do I actually do that in practice? What does that look like geometrically? What is this good for? Big questions we're going to get to, right? Uh, but uh, this is uh, just a starting point, and we will get to all of that stuff. All right. <clears throat> the notation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the notation for a partial derivative is, let's see here, I'll use purple for this. Um, you got various different versions of it. Here's the, the first one I'll talk about. Um, looks a lot like Leibniz notation for a regular derivative. I call your attention, however, to this symbol that we are using. Uh, notice it is not a D. Not a D. You cannot write a D alternatively. D is different. D is unacceptable. D means something different. You cannot, it's not on the table. You cannot use D's here, right? Um, likewise, it's not the lowercase Greek letter delta. Also unacceptable, right? You got to actually <coughs> write this symbol. Uh, I know it seems, whoops, uh, wrong color. Uh, it seems uh, finicky and silly, but um, uh, notations do matter in math. Math is all about precision and uh, uh, so using valid notations really matters. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, that's important. Um, again, it seems silly, but you might have to sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and actually practice making that symbol. Again, it looks a little different, and you have to decide. <coughs> My gosh, excuse me. <coughs> decide if you are an inside-out kind of guy or an outside-in. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay, I hope I got it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, take the time. Make sure that you can make that symbol comfortably, identifiably, quickly. Uh, yeah. Is this symbol only for partial derivatives? This symbol is used for partial derivatives, and it is also used for at least one other thing that we're going to see in this class. Um, later, when we get into chapters 6 and 7, we're going to use this. Uh, to represent boundaries of things. And it's hard to see that coming. Um, and <coughs> But uh, for the moment, just partial derivatives. Yeah. Anybody else? Everybody's happy. Okay. All right. Um, the other notation, and of course, you know, you can uh, be, uh, there's a little bit of flexibility in, you know, where you put the F. <coughs> it's uh, just like with regular Leibniz notation. Uh, here's the other alternative, uh, the variable that you are using as continuing to be a variable that's in the denominator down there, alternatively you can make it a subscript. And this is a pretty common notation uh, as well. And depending on the context, I mean, in some sense, if you don't have a uh, space shortage, this one's a visually more 
conspicuously identifiable, a little bit easier to work with. <coughs> but sometimes it's kind of impractical, and in those situations, we're going to use this. Okay. All right. <coughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. All right. So let's do one. Let's compute. In practice now, rubber meets the road. How do we compute these things? Uh, <coughs> We're going to start with a scary example. Look at this nasty-looking function. It's got oh, multiple factors. It's one of them is cotangent. Oh, I hate cotangents. Oh, you can never remember those rules. Um, it's a composition uh, cotangent of a itself kind of complicated-looking function on the inside. There, this looks like it's going to be brutal. Okay, what you have to do? Step one. Remind yourself what kind of a partial you're taking. That means, uh, in this case here, notice we're taking the partial with respect to y. That is the one that we're not going to hold constant. All of the other variables we're going to hold constant then. That means that uh, in this example here, while y remains the variable, x is a constant and z is a constant, which by the way tells me that e to the x is a constant. And furthermore, x squared e to the z is a constant, and therefore cotangent of all of that constant is itself just a great big constant. So all of this stuff here is constant. And we love constants when we're taking derivatives because, I mean, they, they just kind of sit there, right? It's great. Um, so <clears throat> When you have a constant times y squared and you're taking a derivative with respect to y, well, I mean, exactly as you would think, the, the y partial of y squared is 2y, and the constants just kind of come along for the ride. Nothing happens to those multiplicative constants. Everybody see what happened there? <laughs> pretty sweet. And then, of course, after you've actually done the uh, partial derivative, then you probably want to rethink uh, the notation. And, uh, you know, <coughs> not that it technically matters, but I uh, aesthetically feel like the two should come out to the front. It just looks weird to have a two inside. I don't know, whatever. That's aesthetic. Okay. All right. <coughs> Likewise here. Now, scary-looking function. Oh, my God, function to the power of a function. Oh, my God, do I have to use logarithmic differentiation here? Real quick side note, do you all remember logarithmic differentiation? If, you, if you've never seen logarithmic differentiation, YouTube channel, Miscellaneous Topics, I've got a little short lecture on logarithmic differentiation. It's a nice little tool, very useful in some cases. Turns out we don't need it here because we are taking a partial with respect to x, which means that y is a constant, which means that my entire exponent <coughs> is a constant. <coughs> oh my gosh. So this is a uh, generalized power rule derivative. There's nothing to it. It's just, you know, this constant kind of uh, comes down uh, out front. You subtract one from it. And uh, then don't forget the chain rule. And uh, nothing to it. Everybody happy? Likewise, analogously down here, and in, uh, in the interest of time, I'm let y'all read this one. Um, I, <clears throat> I will comment. Do make sure that you are solid on all of the single variable calculus derivative rules. I, I mean, unavoidably, they're going to come up a lot in this class. So make sure you're good with the chain rule and the power rule and the product rule and the quotient rule and, you know, all the rules for differentiation. I am going to uh, assume that you are, you know, uh, comfortably proficient in uh, all of that, uh, all that skills. Okay. All right. Okay. So next question. What are we doing here? What does it all mean? How is this useful? Am I, did I just make up some nonsense that has no purpose here? If you think about it, there is kind of a suspicious aspect of this. Of, uh, ooh, I've got a hard problem. I want to understand a multivariable function, and I'm just going to play make-believe and pretend. Wouldn't it be nice if these things that are variables weren't variables? 
highly suspicious. Right? I mean, we're going to pretend they're constant, but they're not. So uh, we need to <clears throat> think through what this would look like geometrically, if anything, before we get too excited about you know what we think we may have accomplished here. Otherwise, we're just playing symbolic manipulation games for no apparent reason. All right, now, <clears throat> so geometric interpretations. I'm going to make a call back to what we talked about uh, last time and or the time before. I lose track of time and summer classes, everything moves so fast. But very recently, we were talking about uh, different kinds of pictures, right? If you're talking about, a, I feel like this was yesterday, but if, if you're, yeah, is it yesterday? Thank you. So if you're, <clears throat> if you have a function, that on the one hand, there's the graph of the function, and then there's these other things. You can talk about level sets, for example, of the function. Totally different picture. So what partial derivatives look like if you're looking at a graph of the function, very, very different than what partial derivatives look like if you're looking at level sets of the function. So we're going to have multiple conversations here about, uh, you know, uh, what are the geometric interpretations of partial derivatives. And it's a critical part of this course that you keep those straight, <laughs> right? And, and then, by the way, um, <clears throat> that's why I spend so much time talking about you know, uh, the importance of the difference between a level set and a graph. Because if you don't know if you're looking at a level set or a graph, then you can't make the appropriate choice of which interpretations of calculus to, uh, to take. And you're gonna, uh, be, uh, constantly stepping on landmines and not knowing why, right? So it's really important. I've seen this happen a bazillion times, right? So, <clears throat> alright, so we're gonna start with graphs. <clears throat> so here we go. We're going to talk about a graph. Notice uh, I have right here a graph, right? Uh, this is the graph of this function f. Whatever that formula is, doesn't really matter what the formula is. We're going to keep this general. <clears throat> so looking at a graph of f, notice in particular also only two independent variables because, of course, that's kind of as high as I can go. Uh, if there were more than two independent variables, I'd, I wouldn't be able to draw the picture as, as previously um, bemoaned, right? So two input variables only, x and y, namely kind of the, uh, if you will, the, the, uh, the horizontal uh, part of the graph. <coughs> and now let's, uh, let's uh, th uh, think through what a partial derivative looks like. I'm going to think about partial with respect to y, um, <coughs> just to get the ball rolling. So what would a y partial look like? And just keep in mind, there is a two-step process in understanding a y partial. And each one of those two steps, as it turns out, we already have a geometric interpretation of. So I'm really all I'm going to do here is just kind of put the puzzle pieces together, and uh, turns out we already know in some sense uh, what the answer is going to uh, have to be. So uh, here we go. Step one: we're going to fix all the other variables. Now keep in mind, for the moment, we're talking about partial with respect to y. That means y remains a variable. That means x. We pretend to be a constant. Said differently, we're going to be setting x equal to a fixed value. I'm just going to call it a, for kind of cosmetic reasons, just so it looks like a constant. But uh, we already have a geometric interpretation of this. When you say x equals a, you're talking about taking the x-axis, fixing a value of that axis, namely, we're taking a vertical cross-section perpendicular to the x-axis at the point where x equals a. So that's step one, right? If you're taking a partial with respect to y, we're fixing x. That's what that looks like geometrically. Uh, now let me say that a little bit differently. Um, <clears throat> this plane is vertical. 
this plank because it goes somewhat that way. Uh, it's also what you might call in the y direction in the sense that it also kind of sort of in some sense points that way, right? So uh, this can be confusing. It's easy to accidentally conflate these and uh, think, okay, well, oh, gosh, one variable is becoming constant. Uh, then the plane, uh, which direction does that plane point? Uh, well, that points in the direction of the other variable. You can see how you might inadvertently get these mixed up. So heads up, be careful. Uh, y is the variable. X is the constant. The cross section's in the Y direction. Okay. All right, well, let me just get rid of all this. Uh, so uh, now we're going to reinterpret our. Fu well, actually, let me stay here for a second. We're going to reinterpret our function as a single variable function. Here was my original graph, on which I allow x and y both to be variables. X and y could be any value where that makes this entire surface. But if I fix x, now x is not allowed to be just any value. I no longer have this entire surface because x is only allowed to be just the one value, which means that all I really have then is this cross section of that surface, namely this curve. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, cool. Now, uh, next step, I need to take the derivative with respect to my one variable, my remaining variable, Take the derivative with respect to y. Okay, well, cool. I already have the graph. This is the graph of that single variable function. Z is a function of y. You want to take a derivative? What does that derivative look like? Derivative is the slope of the graph. So, no big deal. Here's that graph of that single variable function. The slope of that graph is what that derivative is. So there you go. The partial derivative with respect to y is the slope. Well, it's the slope of the tangent line. But slope of the tangent line to the graph of the function. Oh, and we should specify. Uh, we're taking, of course, the partial with respect to y. So slope of the tangent line to the graph in the y direction because, of course, we're only allowed to move in the y direction. Everybody on board? Got a nice, natural, uh, convenient, familiar interpretation of partial derivative <coughs> in the y direction. All right, now another exercise I'm going to leave for y'all. And again, this is a good mathematical weightlifting, uh, good practice. Uh, think it through if you're going in the x direction. I'll give away the answer. If you're taking a partial with respect to x, you're going to be looking at the slope in the x direction. I mean, it's exactly what you would expect, but think it through. Draw the corresponding pictures. You're going to start with this, uh, except this is going to be x, and uh, that means you're going to be taking a cross section in the other direction. And uh, think it through. Draw the pictures. Persuade yourself um, that the uh, that the answer is what you would think. Everybody happy? Okay. All right, now, all of that was with graphs. Right, remember the interpretation depends on the picture you're looking at. So what if we're looking at not a graph? Recall this picture, this uh, I, I feel underappreciated uh, picture uh, what I call the literal picture of the function, where you know, again, we take the we take the domain, we draw the domain, and then we take the target. Okay, we draw the target. I mean, we're just literally making a picture of the things that the function is. Uh, the function that takes points from the green to the orange. Yep, there it is. That's representing that process there of going from domain to target. In this picture. Geometrically, what does a partial derivative look like? All right. Well, keep in mind, taking a partial with respect to y, let's say, that means that x and z are going to be constants. And if x and z are constants, I'm stuck on this line. 
where only y changes and x and z are constant on that line. Right? That's, that's, you'll notice parallel to the y-axis. And now if you think about it, um, <coughs> the change in the input is, oh gosh, uh, the change in the input is just going to be represented by, well, how much does y change? It's only y is changing. It's a single variable change. Geometrically, that's what the change in y looks like. It says, how far am I moving along that line? Yeah. How come you're using a dy here instead of the others? Yeah, because so, so here, this is a differential, right? This isn't part of a notation for a derivative, right? This is just literally a differential. It, so that's, that represents a, a change in that one variable. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, it's good, good for you for being, uh, for being on the lookout for that. But, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is how, yeah, the notation works. It is weird, I give you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, that's what an input change looks like. And, uh, let's see, the corresponding output change is, well, how much did the function change as a result? Again, this is a differential, and that's the D. Yeah. Um, so the relationship between input change and output change. That's what this partial derivative does. The partial derivative, and this is largely a flashback to single variable calculus, it's what you multiply by input change to get output change. Uh, you know what I should do though? I should, uh, well anyway, uh, I, I should say df is our linear estimate of the actual output change. Right. Okay, so notice it's not a slope in this picture, right? It's really not a slope <laughs> because we're not looking at a graph. So, yeah, totally different uh, geometric interpret. if you even want to call it that. But this is the best you can do if you're looking at this literal picture to a geometric-ish kind of interpretation of what a partial derivative looks like. Okay. All right, let's talk about level sets. If you're looking at level sets, now th this is a, uh, a just a for example, uh, but suppose you've got all these uh, uh, level sets like this. Uh, keep in mind, you can think of level sets as being kind of like contour lines on a topographical map. And honestly, whenever I'm thinking about uh, level sets, if I'm looking at pictures of level sets, I'm I just think, okay, I'm hiking, right? And each one of these represents a fixed altitude and so you know this is uh this is 300 feet and uh you know this one here is uh 400 feet etc uh this one here is 500 feet um so uh, all of the usual sort of interpretations of you know think of each one of these moving from one of these contour lines to the next contour line costs you Effort, right? It's that's that's altitude gain, right? So with that in mind, let's just kind of think it through. If I were looking in the x direction, right? If I were um, taking the partial derivative with respect to x, that means, of course, that y is constant. Uh, if y is constant, that means that I'm stuck on this line where y is not allowed to change. That means I'm moving in the x direction. And um, how how fast is the function changing? And I, uh, I I would say, look, my my hiking instinct is that that looks like a hard hike. I'm gaining a hundred feet pretty quick. I'm not moved. I don't get to spread out that hundred feet of elevation gain over very much distance there, because just short little distances in the x direction cause me to gain a hundred feet of altitude. That makes sense. So I say that looks steep, and as such, I feel like this partial derivative is large. I'm not going to quantify that, right? Because, I mean, when you draw level sets, of course, it's, you know, it's kind of arbitrary how much vertical separation there is between the level sets. We're not going to be able to be precise about that. But we can say that that looks relatively large. And then uh, likewise, though, if I were to look in the y direction, like this. I'll leave that uh, there. If I were to look in the y direction, well, there's a much greater, just the way these level sets worked out. I mean, I go from here all the way up to here. 
there is much more walking between you know 100 foot elevation gains as I go in the y direction. So uh, moving in the y direction, taking a partial with respect to y, um, less steep. So I feel like this partial with respect to y should be relatively small. Does that make sense? So I mean, now you know, it, mm, this is not precise, right? Um, but this is kind of again the best you can do in this. I mean, level sets uh, are good for some things, but they have their shortcomings, and one of the shortcomings is the way we interpret partial derivatives is a little imprecise. But this is kind of this is the what you can get out of it in some sense. Is that a question? No. No? Okay. Cool. All right. Okay. So next thing we're going to talk about. So, ooh, by the way, I'm just noticing I'm low on battery. Yeah, I have 35 minutes of battery left, and we have 20 minutes of class left. I think we'll make it. All right. We'll chance it. Um, okay. So y'all remember linear approximations. I'm sure y'all remember this formula right here from uh, from Calc 1. Um, <clears throat> now, what is a linear approximation? Where did this come from? Right, what's the definition of a linear approximation? And there's some delicacies uh, to this. I'm going to start by sweeping most of the delicacies under the rug. Come back to it in a few minutes or later anyway. Um, so I'm going to momentarily assume that the linear approximation exists. So that's, we're going to assume that. Now th that's a mouthful. This is a huge amount of assumption. We'll come back to what that assumption means and how to tell and what's the difference uh, in, uh, in a bit. But uh, on that assumption, okay, so what is a linear approximation? Well, it's a linear in the sense of degree one polynomial, no quadratic terms, that agrees with the function as much as possible. I want it to have the same value as the function at the point in question. I want it to have the same first derivative as the function at the point in question. I want it to mimic the function as much as possible at the point in question. And this formula does it. Uh, you can uh, you can persuade yourself. Uh, again, good exercise. You've probably already done this in a Calc 1 class. Uh, this function does have the same value as f at the point A. And this function does have the same first derivative as f at the point A. Make sure you can do that. Make sure you're algebraically that you can compute these L of A and L prime of A and that you get these answers. Okay. And if, and uh, by the way, if you're as usual, you know, look with all of my suggested exercises, you know, let, leave as a practice to the, to the, to the student. If you get stuck, if you have questions, come on into office hours. I'm very happy to help you with these things. I just think it's a good idea to give it a shot yourself first and then come on into office hours. We'll, uh, we'll work it out in full detail. Okay. Old news. All right. What if you have a multivariable function? in different input variables. I claim this is the answer. I claim this is the linear approximation. I claim this is the function that has the same value as f at the point A and that has all of the same partials um, as f at the point A. Now I just pulled this out of a hat. I didn't derive this, right? I didn't. Uh, I didn't earn it in some sense, right? But uh, eh, you don't have to if you know that the thing that you're looking for is defined by certain characteristics. If you have an answer that came to you from your inner oracle, right? Whatever doesn't matter really where it came from. 
Uh, if it's got the defining characteristics, then it's right. You don't have to actually have derived it. Um, and uh, so, again, this is uh, uh, something you can just directly confirm. This expression that I have here in orange has all of the required characteristics. Okay, so another good exercise. Make sure that you can confirm all of these requirements. Now you're gonna notice uh, that this formula and uh, this formula here look a lot alike. Uh, you see for one thing that the F of A term is morally the same. I mean, obviously the down at the bottom there's multiple input variables, so A is now a vector, okay, fine. But other than that, it's morally the same. And then you kind of notice that derivative times change just keeps showing up and you just get one extra such term for each of the variables. So it's kind of plausible. I mean, it's it, it kind of, again, it, this is probably what you would guess. Um, it's a reasonable first guess, um, just cosmetically. Um, so um, yeah, that's kind of a nice observation. And then of course, again, uh, it, it being a reasonable first guess is only so persuasive. The fact that it does what it's supposed to is really what makes it persuasive. Okay, now I want to talk about the way we write it, our notations, uh, and I want to look in particular at all of these terms over here. Notice in each one of these terms, one of the factors is a partial uh, missed. Uh, ooh, come on, a partial derivative evaluated at the point A. By the way, that's what this vertical line here means. A vertical line with kind of a subscript means you're going to evaluate that expression at that point. Um, and then that's being multiplied by a change in the corresponding variable. So this is green times blue plus green times blue plus green times blue, et cetera, et cetera. That looks exactly like a dot product, doesn't it? I mean, structurally, that's just got all the earmarks of a dot product. So in fact, we're going to sort of uh, make that work. I'm going to turn that into a dot product by observing that all of this stuff in blue, are those are literally just the coordinates of the vector X minus A. The blue uh, factors there are literally the coordinates of the vector X minus A. These green factors, well, we've never really seen the vector whose coordinates are those green factors. So I'm just going to define this thing here. Uh, literally, the coordinates are just those green factors. That's it. Right? It's just, uh, I, I, this is what I need this green vector to be so that I can view that as a dot product. And then I'm going to give that a name. We're going to call that the gradient. It's just a notational convenience. So, so I, I, you know, I'm just, this is just a definition. Uh, we're going to call it the gradient. We're going to use this notation. It's an upside down triangle. Um, uh, so this is called the gradient of that function. Uh, well, it's the function f, of course. Uh, the, I, I, you, I wrote g here because I just wanted to keep this general. Um, but um, anyway, I, the vector of partial derivatives is what we call the gradient of a function. Is that cool? All right. Okay, so that really does help then with the uh, the notation. Now I can rewrite, uh, and you know, rather than having to every time I want to do a linear approximation, oh my gosh, I've got to write down all this stuff. I've got a dot dot dot. That's kind of annoying. Uh, now instead, I have this much more sort of compact and convenient formula. Nice bookkeeping, sort of shorthand. All right, let's do one. Let's get our hands dirty. Um, <clears throat> let's do a linear approximation of that function at this point. Okay, let's see here. Uh, first thing I've got to do, f of a. At this point, a equals one, two. All right, well, I plug that into my function. 
and F of A is five. Math to it, a little bit of arithmetic. Now let's talk about, uh, let's see here, let's talk about this term over here. That's going to end up being uh, all of this stuff. Uh, the easy part of that is x minus a. That's, that's easy. Here it is, x minus a. Uh, notice uh, in particular uh, that a in orange, 1 comma 2. Right? The x, x comma y. Right, so x minus a, that's just a recopy, basically. Um, now I've got to compute, uh, let's see here, I've got to compute uh, color choices. I'll use dark blue, the gradient at a. Well, just keep in mind the gradient is made up of the partial derivatives. Don't forget how to compute partial derivatives. I got to plug in the point. Oh, whoops. Oh, uh, no, I wanted the blue. Uh, plug in the, the uh, a, uh, x equals 1, y equals 2. That makes at the point in question we have 2 comma 4, and boom. That's the gradient. This is straight up plug and chug. And then you can, uh, if you want, and uh, you know, you really don't have to do this, uh, suit yourself. Uh, I actually honestly would kind of rather you just leave it like this. Um, there's nothing wrong with th this. Ex in fact, there's something really nice about this expression. I can see where I'm at, what my gradient is, and the role of the input change. I can see them in the way this is written. I think that's nice. Um, but I, I guess you could multiply it out, and uh, you know, I suppose if you were gonna, if you were coding this into a program where you had to compute this a bunch, then yeah, sure, code it up efficiently. I, I, fine, okay. But in practice, most of the time, uh, it's nice to just leave it like this. Okay. Everybody happy? Okay. So um, <clears throat> notational convenience. Really helpful. Um, for our next example of this, we're going to have to set up another notational convenience. Here, I want to entertain the question of what if not only are we looking at a multivariable function, but what if furthermore it's vector valued? What if there are several output variables too? All right, well, I'm just going to start with the notational convenience here because if I didn't use the notational convenience, the expression would be a nightmare, all right? And nobody wants that. Um, so straight up, starting with the notational convenience, I'm going to define this thing called DF. I'm pulling this out of a hat, all right? So that this didn't come from anywhere that I can point to. I'm just going to just write it down. And uh, here we go. Uh, it's a matrix, you'll notice. Notice that all the entries are partial derivatives. <coughs> notice the way it's organized, and this is very, very important. These are not, you can't just take all the partial derivatives and kind of toss them in there, right? They have to go according to a particular pattern. The first row, all of the entries in the first row are partials of the first output coordinate, F1. Uh, likewise for the remaining rows. Notice also the first column. Now let me circle that better. The first column, all of them are partials with respect to x1. Very important. First column has to correspond to partials with respect to the first input variable, and then again, sort of likewise as you go across. So heads up about that organization. By the way, do be careful about accidentally transposing this, right? So whoops, it's easy to mess this up right here. And that's, ooh, I did the row thing for the columns, and I did the column things for the rows. It's easy to be surprised how easy it is to mess that up. So do what you got to do to make sure that you get this right. Transposing is super wrong, <laughs> right? This matrix is not symmetric, typically. Um, okay, so uh, with that noted, 
Again, this is just pulled out of nowhere. This is uh, Inner Oracle. Um, this is the magic function. This is the linear approximation of that vector valued multivariable function. Um, the little shorthand that we made up, that matrix, is doing some real heavy lifting here. The matrix is organizes all of all of these terms, all n times m of those terms in the linear approximation. It all goes into a matrix vector product organized by that matrix. Um, but uh, then also notice that uh, this has got a lot of the earmarks that we saw from the previous page. The first term is just f of a. And all of this is a bookkeeping organizational tool times the input change x minus a. So structurally, this looks a lot like what we had on the previous pages. And again, exercise for you. Confirm that this has the right value and all of the right partials for all of the outputs with respect to all of the inputs. Um, as the original function f. And so again, you know, this is a nice uh, practice problem. Uh, just for the purpose of realism, I suggest that you do this for a three by three matrix only. There's no need to do like a, you know, n by n, you know, or five by five. That's, that's too much details. But do it for a three by three and confirm for yourself that this actually has all the right algebraic characteristics that I've got written down here. Okay, so again, in practice, let's get our hands dirty and do one. Um, here's our structure of our answer. Here's how it works out. So again, it's just a matter of uh, evaluating the function f at the given point. Then, uh, of course, we have x minus a. That's, again, just a matter of writing it down. Most of the work here, then, is in figuring out what this matrix is the DF matrix, and the structure of the DF matrix is above. We'll start off by taking partials with respect to the first variable. Our first variable is X. Keep in mind, partials with respect to input variables correspond to columns of the matrix, right? Partials with respect to input variables correspond to columns. Make sure to keep that straight. Don't don't make it rows. Then you're gonna get a wildly wrong answer. So ah, easy partial derivative. Now this you just get, you got to do the algebra there. And again, make sure that you're good with this. But taking partials with respect to x1, excuse me, taking partials with respect to that first input variable, which is x, gives me that first column. And then likewise, partials with respect to the second variable is gonna give me. Uh, the second column, which is there. <coughs> and uh, having done that, we evaluate at the point in question, and we're good. Everybody happy? Okay. All righty. Um, real quick observations. Let's see, how are we going to be doing today? Oh, yeah, you know, okay, we're good. Um, we've already kind of made this observation. Um, the columns are partials with respect to input variables. The uh, rows are, if you think about it, they're the partials of output variables, but a vector of partials of a single variable of a, of a single uh, uh, function is in fact a gradient. So if you kind of put those pieces together, notice that the, each row is a gradient of a coordinate function. Okay. All right, and then a quibbly little language thing. Um, <sighs> this is annoying. Um, I don't know if y'all were ever bothered by this once you took a linear algebra class, but uh, this function is not linear, right? And yet they call it a linear approximation. Uh, okay, fine. <laughs> I mean, but uh, come on. It's, I mean, look, it's, it's, 
it, it's linear in the sense of uh, look the graph of it's a line uh, and quibble quibble quibble. Um, so technically, the term for a function that has this form is that it's affine. That's just a little cultural point. You don't need to know that. Um, but what you can uh, do is look at this term only. This term only is linear, and likewise, um, this being as it is a matrix. And flash back to first day of class, matrices are linear, right? So when we call this a linear approximation, a case can be made that the re a motivation for calling this function linear is that even though there's an extra term there, then okay, yeah, fine. Look, but the the thing that's doing the heavy lifting is linear. So, you know, anyway, that's kind of the 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 the, the rationale there. Okay, a real quick ending observation. Um, uh, Y'all have seen tangent lines before. Uh, again, a single variable calculus. Um, the tangent line it relates very closely to the linear approximation, but they're not the same thing. There's the linear approximation. Old news, right? Single variable linear approximation. The tangent line is the graph of that linear approximation. Not quite the same thing. Again, importantly, a linear approximation is a function. A tangent line is a geometric object. They're not the same, right? So, just this is largely reminder and and also at the same time, sort of like warning, uh, to make sure to uh, keep these distinct in your mind. And the the same deal applies in a multivariable context. So here you'll notice we have a function of now two variables that we're looking at the graph of instead of one. And, well, we have a pre-existing formula for our linear approximation. It's a function. Its graph is the tangent plane. And again, make sure to keep these separate in your mind. Yeah, I know it's a uh, seemingly fussy point, but uh, it's important to distinguish between uh, functions and how we view functions geometrically. Okay, and that's a nice stopping point, uh, and we will pick up here on uh, tomorrow, uh, Thursday. So see you all later. Have a good one.